Selamat datang. Sebelum dimulainya acara, kami selaku tim kesehatan dan keselamatan kerja akan menyampaikan safety induction. Safety induction ini merupakan implementasi dari Undang-Undang Nomor 1 Tahun 1970 mengenai keselamatan kerja. Luangkan waktu sejenak untuk menemukan pintu keluar terdekat. Potensi bahaya yang ada pada kawasan ini adalah kebakaran dan gempa bumi. Apabila munculnya asap atau getaran secara tiba-tiba, harap tetap tenang dan jangan panik. Perhatikan langkah Anda ketika menuju pintu keluar dan lindungi kepala Anda. Alat pemadam api ringan tersedia di setiap ruangan. Pada keadaan darurat, dihimbau untuk tidak menggunakan lift. Sebaiknya gunakan tangga evakuasi yang telah tersedia. Tetap tenang dan ikuti instruksi selanjutnya dari petugas. Titik kumpul terdekat terletak di depan pos pemadam kebakaran. Saat berada di studio teater ini, Anda perlu memperhatikan hal-hal berikut. Dilarang makan dan minum di dalam ruangan. Dilarang menggunakan rokok atau rokok elektrik bentuk lainnya di dalam ruangan. Perhatikan dan ikuti rambu-rambu yang ada. Perhatikan barang bawaan Anda dan buang sampah pada tempatnya. Dilarang membawa narkoba, minuman keras, senjata api, dan senjata tajam. Saat acara ini selesai, semua aturan keselamatan yang disampaikan di awal tetap berlaku di seluruh kawasan Taman Ismail Marzuki. Terima kasih atas perhatiannya. Salam keselamatan! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jakarta Content 2023. Before we start the discussion, I am honored to introduce our esteemed chair, Ms. Laura Prinsloo, who will commence the event with the opening remarks. For Ms. Laura, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the last session of Jack Tent. This is not so much of an a, uh, an opening remarks, because I just want <laughs> I just want to thank um, a lot of um, friends that has made this session happen, especially the Erasmus House. Uh, our cooperation with Erasmus House since, uh, has started since 2021 when we first had Lala and Lara. Uh, that was our first session during the pandemic. And then um, it was very successful and then we continued with Marik uh, Lucas. Also it was done online uh, and then Dido Mickelson. And then with the book, uh, the, the Fair of Bobo. And then now we have Marion Bloom. This won't happen if it wasn't of the support of Erasmus House. So thank you. Uh, but I, I also want to thank uh, the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador Lambert Green, Uh, who's unfortunately cannot be here. Uh, the regional director of Erasmus House, Mr. Nicolas de Direct, and then our dear friend, 
Pak Bob Wardanaan because of him actually all these programs are uh, possible um, and then our curator Lontar Foundation um, this year uh, because of the successful of Bobo exhibition uh, we had more than 4,000 uh, people came to Erasmus House to see uh, how Bobo has evolved uh, over the last what many decades we have this exhibition again on the third floor. Uh, so for those that haven't had the chance to see uh, the exhibition, it's still open until uh, tonight. And then tonight, we have the opportunity to listen uh, of a conversation between Marion Bloom and Ayu Tami, uh, especially discussing about her books and uh, focusing on the growing up as a Indo uh, mix uh, cultured um, Indonesian and Netherlands in the Netherlands from in the past until nowadays. So thank you so much everybody and I hope you enjoy the session and again thank you Erasmus House for making this session happen. Thank you Ma Laura. Now I would like to invite Mr. Bob Wardana from Erasmus House to deliver his remarks, share his insights and thoughts. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bob Wardana. Thank you, I will keep it short for two hours. Selamat sore semua. Good afternoon everybody. It was very delighted and a pleasure for Erasmus Eyes to work together with Yayasan Pulau Imaji because this is uh, our first start working with Pulau Imaji from uh, 2021. We are uh, working on literacy uh, project. Mostly Erasmus is quite uh, famous with his concert event of exhibition. But thanks uh, again for Yayasan Pulau Imaji that approached us to work together uh, to bring the literacy program. Uh, here uh, we are very happy that we can uh, bring Marion Bloom, the Dutch writer, and together with uh, Ayu Utami, uh, that we are going to hear uh, their discussion and their thoughts. And as uh, Ibu Laura said, Erasmus has been working together with Jack Dance in 2021 until this year, 2023. Uh, I would like to say thank you to uh, Jack Ten, Frankfurt, Book Fair and the curator lead Fest Yayasan Lontar and uh, Ibu Laura and his crew and uh, her her crew and her staff uh, from Yayasan 17,000 Pulau Imaji because this cannot happen if uh, I work uh, Erasmus work alone so we have to work together uh, like co-creation uh, sharing uh, experience together and then uh, what I can say during the Jack Ten, so I get uh, the inspiration from Jack Ten of the writer. Uh, they said on uh, one thing what I learned from the writer. Mulailah selalu membawa dua buku. Satu buku untuk dibaca dan satu buku untuk menulis. Always bring two books with you. One book to read and one book to write. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bob Wadana to guide us through this enriching session. Please welcome our moderator, Ms. Ayu Utami, who will now take the stage to moderating this session. For Mbak Ayu, the floor is yours. Selamat sore hadirin semuanya. Good uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to keep uh, time, to, to spend the time too long, so I will ask my friend Marion to join uh, with me to the front and give a very warm applause to Marion Bloom. Yeah, if we can. Yeah. So uh, it's a very happy time to meet Marion again, I think. Uh, I host you, this is the third time I host you. I hosted you too, <laughs> yeah. the first, very first time. <laughs> the first time. Um, I met Marion in 2000, 2000, 
2000 or 2001, I forgot, but it was in uh, the Netherlands, in, um, in Amsterdam. And at that time, my book, my first book, Saman, was translated and published in, 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 in Dutch. And Marion was my, uh, my host at that time. <laughs> and that's the way uh, we met each other. And I'm very honored to be interviewed by Marion Bloom at the time, like 23 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, how did this li this kid write a book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we are. I think we are, we both of us are still children, are still kids. And I uh, I know Marion very well. He, she is still uh, a child in her heart, just like you. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Marion Bloom is an award-winning literary writer from the Netherlands with English or Indo background. Her background makes her more special for Indonesian readers. Not only, of course, he, she is very special for her works, but her background makes it more special and relevant to Indonesian readers. And she had won several prestigious awards. Uh, among others is Edgar de Perron Prize. Edgar or Edward? Ed Edgar, yeah? Yes, I think I was in the first dark yeah. woman in to the receive. Netherlands to uh -huh. receive the prize. Yeah. Just like we did other recent prize. Uh -huh. And so. the recent prize is Constantine Hagen Prize. Yeah. The Constantine Hagen Prize? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Hagen. <laughs> it's good, you pronounce it really well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very prestigious prize in the Netherlands, and Marion is one of the very few women writers to receive this prize, and the first uh, Indo-women? Uh, definitely the first woman who is not white, and uh -huh. I think the second woman uh, who got the... So white. we are very uh, honored to have a very uh, important writer to talk with us today. And according to the jury, Bloom's writing is personal, original, <clears throat> compelling, and based on great social commitment. And not only a writer, Marion is also a filmmaker, a, a visual artist, uh, and also a poet. And she, she does many things to, uh, at the same time. Just not cooking. <laughs> <laughs> And Marion, welcome to Jakarta. Sorry, sorry, yeah. I saw Lambert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Welcome yeah. to the room, <laughs> Mr. Uh, ambassador. I met Marion like 23, uh, 23 years ago, I think. It was 2000, right? I thought it was longer ago. <laughs> longer? Yeah. Well, I, are you sure? Because it was your new uh, translation in, uh, in Dutch, right? Yeah. So you should know, yeah. Yeah. And um, Marion has written many, many books, and unfortunately, if I'm not wrong, yeah, only one, one is translated completely and published in Indonesian language. Uh, it's titled in Indonesian, Mumi Gadis Berusia Seratus Taun, uh, which is translated beautifully by Wijayanti Darmowiono and uh, published by KPG in 2016. It's rather some time ago, yeah. Yeah? yeah? I hope uh, the book is um, ready outside. And, but you can check in Wikipedia or in Marion, Marion's Bloom um, website, marionsbloom.com, to know the complete title of her books. But within this very limited time, we will, I think we will concentrate to three books that yeah. Up to you. Yeah, three yeah. books is the um, Mumi. Uh, but the first is the, uh, because this book, Mumi Garis uh, Ratus Taun, atau Bahasa Belandanya, I think is... Uh, what it's is actually it? the same title, like the second, the, the subtitle of the Mumi, uh -huh. is the title of the Dutch... How do you pronounce uh, it? Meishis with... Uh, Meishis van Meishis van 100. Meishis yeah. yeah. Gadis uh, Ratusetahun. It relates to your the book that makes you become internationally renowned. The uh, 
gaan gewoon in die meisje. Ah, she laughed. Geen gewoon in die meisje. <laughs> Or be no ordinary in the girl. Yes, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's because a, it's, it's not. Really yeah, because I'm playing with the uh, with the words. So uh, the way if you use it, geen gewoon in die meisje. It it uh, imp- is an implicit meaning that um, the person tries to not be what she is mm-hmm. in Dutch. Ah. But once you translated it, it's more, it will become a more general sen- line. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, it's, so it's hard to it translate. Is, it yeah. ha- it's hard to translate. And um, and it also relates to the next book, the Meisjes uit het dorp. Meisjes uit het dorp, yeah. My, I, Girls actually, from the yeah. villages, yeah. I have to admit something here. Uh-huh. It was the publisher who wanted to, uh, wanted it to be a tril- trilogy. Uh-huh. Not you also. Not myself. No, I wouldn't be able to, because I think my books are the next book is always a result of what the book before. So, mm-hmm. and and this is a process in life, and and by for them to take these three out was also because if I was. F- a writer for 50 years and it was 40 years ago that my first novel was uh, out and successful right away so they thought that to celebrate this they should do something mm-hmm. extra special and that's why they really wanted to come up with a trilogy i could totally agree with the fact that the three books have have uh, connection. are connected but it wouldn't have been my idea mm-hmm. But you don't mind to have I don't this, mind, no, no. And it is published, right? Or it, it will be published? In, uh, no, it was published uh, with the same cover as is to celebrate my uh, 50 years mm-hmm. as a writer. With the pictures, with your own pictures as the cover, right? Uh, and my grand, little granddaughter, who has his birthday, her birthday today, she was three years old when she made a, the basic drawing for it. And she told me how she wanted it. And then I was painting it later on the way she wanted it and made it my own painting a little little Mm -hmm. but her in mind and then when they asked me to make uh to give uh something for the cover so that the three books would look alike though Mm -hmm. they wouldn't be the same uh, i chose that one because uh all the three books are actually for me an important heritage or in yeah to in for my my grandchildren to inherit because they live in a easier world now even though they are Oh, so they they are rooted in Indonesia and consequences of the colonial time. Mm-hmm. I think it's a lot easier to survive, but they should know about the past. So I thought it was a good idea to use her drawing. So it's actually not typical for me uh-huh. the drawing, but it's more a cooperation. Um, I suggest you dr- um, go Google it because the cover is beautiful. With this color, <laughs> yeah, orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's her well, choice. The colors are her choice. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> The rainbow colors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like your shirt, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> okay, um, her works often deals with the relation between the Netherlands and Indonesia or the former colony of the Dutch Indies. This is what the jury uh, wrote, I think. And uh, Indo subtitle is a personal history about identity and blooms explored Indo culture, what it is made of, and why it is still used. And I think this is the uh, question you can later elaborate to Marion. Uh, and it is a work that anyone who is interested in the theme of identity should read, states the jury. Uh, <clears throat> we will talk about the connection of three of your books that Geen Gewoon Indisch Meisje, No Ordinary Indisch or Indo Girl, and Meisje von 100, the Gadis Ratus Town, and Meisjes at, at the Girls from the Village. So they, in the title, they are all about Meisjes. Yeah. What is it about yeah. Meisjes? You know Meisjes in Indonesia? What is Meisjes in Indonesia? You have a haha chocolate? Yeah, chocolate sprinkles. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, as much as much as <laughs> yeah, these are the the little rats. What yeah. you call rat here? Um, what uh, 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 what is the word in uh, in uh, no, it, 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 it took it took it took oh, yeah, no, 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 yes. This is this is this no, mousie, chocolate no. chocolate. Listen, <laughs> mousie is tikus. Yeah, yeah, but this is not tikus. <laughs> this is not the Mickey Mouse's. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> This is messes, meshes, meshes, dulu. It's a, a, a spring. Yeah. yeah. Chocolate sprinkle. L- listen, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I'm a writer and I write yeah. in Dutch, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Mousjes is UI, means tiku. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But <laughs> what is it about meshes in. Meshes is girls. Yeah, girls in. Yeah. Because these two, they, the titles. They walk on two men, feet, yeah. okay? Yeah. Not on four. <laughs> It depends. It depends. Usually, okay. not. What is what is it about meshes that you that you as a writer you need to write about about it in three books or even more books? No, more books even. Yeah, yeah. because I'm a woman, mm-hmm. and uh, I think uh, there were two little books about uh, for me to read when I was young, when I was a mesh a girl. <laughs> Um, of course, I loved reading. I mean, I discovered to read. I mean, you had to li- uh, read literature in the high school, and there was never ever a book that really hit me enough. Mm-hmm. Only when I started to discover books from abroad, then I had some connection mm-hmm. of it, and then I realized that's because not only because it's a woman about a woman, the the main character woman, but but because it was written by a woman. And it was written from the soul of a woman, and so I decided I want to write to uh, to to be able to have all the girls mm-hmm. read more books with the soul of a true woman, a girl, because that was lacking. And if a man tries to write about a, a girl, it's also from the outside, and we don't recognize ourselves. And so I wanted to write from the heart. And then the other reason is that I think girls living between cultures, they are much more, men too, in a way, in another way, they are um, victims of prejudice. Prejudice? Prejudice? Prejudice. prejudice. I think that's it. Yeah, prejudice. I also have to ask John. <laughs> yeah, oh, a good is here. Good is here. And uh, anyway, good. The jury are. <laughs> and. Uh, girls, in another way, it's always sexual. It's always you become um, either an example of a tr- uh, you be a trophy for the uh, dominant um, population, you know, to catch, or you'd be a person to avoid because you're either cold or ugly. That's what happens to girls if they're from mig- migrants. They're considered in the first moment this way, and. It's very hard being a girl to try to find a way to deal with that. And uh, we were the first migrants, obvious migrants, even though we were called, um, uh, well, how do I translate that? Um, okay, it was, we were considered to be Dutch, but we weren't treated like Dutch mm-hmm. people. We were treated more like migrants, they would usually treat migrants a bit a lot of uh, racism and discrimination. And uh, and um, somehow the colony had taken this prejudice, prejudice. prejudice from the uh, colony, colonial time that we would uh, be hot and easy to get. Mm-hmm. So when you grow up, that's a really tough thing to deal with. It's uh, when you're 12, 13, 14, you don't know about this, but nevertheless, you're confronted with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I ask this because I personally, as a writer, I still couldn't succeed in writing about from the perspective of the female character unless it is me. So, I, you know, my, my, my book, Saman, is the main character is a man and the other book I is know, also a man. Yeah. Maybe it's my problem. That's why I asked this well, question you, to you. <laughs> no, you need you need a lot of courage, because um, what I I consider everybody, but nobody, usually people don't need it. But the writers and artists do need it. We need a gold uh, a gold mine to dig from, and we have to realize the gold mine is here. And we look 
at the outside, we will not have enough soul in the characters. So, but it takes courage to look at your own pain, <laughs> mistakes, the rotten parts of your character. You know, to look at it, and also the 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 parts of you that are still in pain or traumatized, and to look at it from a distance. And what I learned already at a young stage was because I had difficult youth, very difficult. And the only way to escape from that reality mm -hmm. was to become like an eagle, or what we call a bowser, uh, there's another type of uh, dangerous bird. And to look at the situation from above and to feel like, okay, this is it, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I can also, so my, my best dreams and in trouble were always that I could fly and look at the best dream. My best dreams. And uh, that would help me through life. That's, I think, that also made me a writer. And uh, so I still use that in moments that are really tough. Uh, the only escape for me is to become that mm -hmm. ego. So I know, uh, but later on, if this is really tough what's happening, but later on I'll laugh about it. Mm -hmm. Or later on, it's a story. And sometimes I even think, already, it's a story. It's okay. I have to go through this. It's a story. Mm -hmm. You see? So... But once you decide that, you have to go back in and dig and to get all the, the dirt out. Because the dirt is nice to read for the public. <laughs> <laughs> so the audience like to read our dirt. In fact, they do. <laughs> <laughs> but before uh, we go to your, um, your, your life, I want to start with the book. Mommy, Gadis Ratus Taun. Do you mind to give a short explanation about it? No, um, but no, can I tell like something it. about yeah. the why I wrote the book? Yes. In 19... Probably in 1978, 79, mm -hmm. I met a woman from Indonesia. She didn't know if she was mixed Indo or if she was Indonesian because she grew up in an orphanage. And she had a very strong character. And apart from that, she was also psychic. I don't know how to say that in the Indonesian word. Tenayang. Yeah. Um, and but she was uh, 80 already, and she became in, a, in an age that it even was gr growing stronger. That if she'd sit in my place here and she'd see you, she would see all your trouble, your future, or or past, oh, and it would just bother her. So she had to tell it. If she wouldn't tell it, it would hurt too much ah. because she would feel your pain and she wants to tell you about the pain, like like you could prevent it. And she knew you, you, people cannot prevent the future. I mean, you cannot get away from it. But nevertheless, you know, it was like she had to. She just had to. And um, and my father met her and, and said, oh, you have to meet this woman because the woman said, okay, you have four kids, but that's one who's not like the others. I want to meet her. And my father immediately knew oh, she met me. So she, the psychic wants to wanted to meet you. Yeah, and she said she said a lot to me. You must be very special. No, I think she used me as a tool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she just thought, oh, she's the one, you know, can be can be my tool. Um, so she 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 told a lot of things. She also prevented Evans' disease, for example. Oh. Pre, not pre. What is the word? Pre. Uh, Predicted, predicted, oh, sorry, yeah, prevented, I, I, I wish she did. She prevented, uh, sorry, she, she predicted, so my wish is stronger than the reality. Uh, she predicted his disease, but she also told us, don't worry, when they give the diagnose, it will still take a long time before it really, really will be uh, severe. So don't worry what the doctors will say. That is also, of course. Well, it was already, she told that uh, already in the 1970s, something. Then she said that, yeah. is it? And when he, his age would be 54, she, uh, he would get a very severe disease, and the doctors would tell him, you know, it would go, he would die, but don't you worry, he will live much longer. So, of course, you think, I don't want to know if he's at the age of 54, he's going, you know, I mean, so I, I was irritated actually. I thought, you don't say things like that to people, you know, you, we don't want to know. So, uh, but she was a great woman. 
and she taught me a lot about her life, about life mm -hmm. in general. And she also told me, you going to write our history. I said, oh, no way. I'm not a historian. I love to write about relationships, mm -hmm. you know, sex, love, but not well, about history. history. So, but in the end, I did write it. And that's a strange thing. She made me write it at the, in 2000, I think in 2000. 12, I think I started to write it, and I actually I but felt it took, it took a very long time from 1970 something to 2012. Yes, but it was uh, I, I knew I didn't want to write it in the first place. I thought it's not my business, but it came back all the time. And then she also predicted 9/11, and when 9/11 ha happened, I thought, my God. Then in 2002, Ivan was 54. And that happened too. Then the doctors had told us that he would only live for two and a half years, but he was still there after many years, even though, of course, yeah, the, it was not a nice disease, but he was still there. So then I realized there's more, there's more that she said, that I had to think of her all the time. And I couldn't reach her anymore because we moved out and she always called me, but uh, the, also the phone number changed. So I realized I can never get in touch with her anymore. Maybe she died because it was eight, she was 80 when we met. So I, I had to think about her a lot. And then all the memories of the, what she told about her own life. And all of a sudden I knew, oh, this is a book. By using her as a character, I can tell 100 years of history because she has this possibility to predict as well as to see things from the past, as, to, as well to see things in the, on other places where she's not. So this is the best way to tell such complicated history as the colonial history and the new history of Indonesia. So I realized she had given me a lot of presents and especially with this. And then I, I knew I had to write it. I wrote like two, three pages. That is the, the first part of the book. And then I thought, oh, no, no, it's too difficult. I don't even know about being psychic, you know? I don't know how people think. And, and So I stopped. Then I went to a jazz festival, very famous in Holland. Uh, I don't know what, how, how you call it in, in English. But anyway, I was there. And my husband and my uh, sister and her husband were going off. Because I, I always go to the Kamamandi. I came out. And there was this man from India with a red okay. thing here. He stopped me and said, can I please talk to you? Um, no, 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 I'm in a hurry. Just a minute. I said, well, okay, if you really have a minute, because, you know, I'm well educated, so I thought, okay, minutes, okay, a minute. And he said, yeah, you, you are very artistic. <sighs> you want money? No, no, I don't want money. <laughs> um, so you, a writer? Yeah, I'm a writer. How do you know? No, I, I, I can tell, he said, from your forehead. <laughs> what can you tell from my forehead? So I really thought he was, this guy was tricking me. And uh, and so I said, oh, sorry, I'm really in a hurry. No, but can I just ask you three questions? I said, no, sorry, no time. He said, it only takes three minutes. Do you, don't you have three minutes in your life for me? And I felt so, so I said, okay, three minutes, yes. The request is already three minutes. <laughs> but sorry. <yeah. laughs> in the end, in the end, when I admitted, because he was uh, showing me that he knew what was inside of me, and he proved it. I definitely proved it. It's too intimate to tell. And then he said to me, you've got to write that book. And don't sign that contract that they, are, and it was true, there was somebody from the film industry who tried to make me. Don't do that. That is not is in the way. Write that book that you already wrote for. You have to do that. I said, now, I don't know what book you're talking about, but I immediately know that it was this book. And then I said, I, I don't know. He said, you don't need to worry. Everybody will help you. Everybody will help me? Everybody. He will help you. And then I decided I had to write a book. That book, particularly. So the book is called The Girls. A Meisje van 100? Yeah, The Girl with um, 100,000 Years. Hundred-year-old girl. Hundred-year-old girl. That's the Mumi. Her name was Mumi, so I kept oh, the her same name. name. Was, yes. So Mo you keep Mumi your name. Mumi is the name. Yeah. So um, 
um, probably the audience, we are sometimes we, we go to private. Uh, Marion is talking about her husband, Ivan, who, who was a writer who, as well, who was a photographer and a great yeah. writer, a medical doctor, a uh, medical doctor. Yeah. Uh, and um, the book have, like Marion said, it covers the period of 100 years from 1906 uh, from the Puputan uh, battle, Puputan war in Bali to the to Bali the, bombings. Uh, Bali to, to after the Bali bombings. So after the Bali bombings and uh, also the nine one one things. It's in between. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, and it's about the family of Indo background, the di the dilemma to stay in Indonesia or to be expelled from Indonesia, and the call to come back to Indonesia. My question is: uh, you you have to. I ha I hope the book is out there. No. Well, it, it's a it very should, beautiful book, yeah, and uh, it, it, especially if you know the background. Uh, and my question, because there is always a call to go back to Indonesia. Why do the protagonists need to come back or to visit Indonesia to settle? The she wants to understand where she's from. She doesn't know her, her mom. She knows everything about other people. She... The people she sees in the streets, she sees the Japanese soldiers marching, and she thinks, well, how, well, how is it possible? I can see her, their mothers marching with them, and I cannot see my own mother. I don't know who my mother is. Mm -hmm. And I cannot betray the, the story totally. I think it's not important if you know, but in the end, she knows where she's from. So for me, it's also a statement that the Dutch identity or the Dutch as entity have to visit Indonesia because part of the... I don't know, the interesting thing was when I went on tour with the book, many uh, science people, uh, social science as well as uh, literature people, uh, uh, philosophers, read the book and commented on it and they actually, and also readers, I, uh, students I met, they all the time told me and I was very uh, impressed by that, that the book is about identity. And they said about the identity of the Indonesian people, uh, that not knowing after all, everything they went through, not knowing who are we and where are we going, you know, what, what do we want? Because uh, we are one nation, but we are not the same, and, but we are uh, 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 supposed to be the same. This was, that was a very interesting response to me because when I wrote it, I wanted Mumi to discover that she was not at all, had nothing to do her, her, her in the sense of rooted. She had nothing to do with the Dutch, but in the sense of history, she had a lot to do with the Dutch. Mm -hmm. And that is, you cannot really separate that. It's not a, just a blood thing if you are, I mean, the whole history will make you too. Traumas will make you. It's not just that you are what you are, what your uh, DNA is telling you. It is also the history in which you grow up is telling who you become and who you are. And you have to face it if you, especially if you want to be a writer, but also if you want to understand yourself, you have to understand your parents' and grandparents' traumas. That's my belief. Yeah. So how, tell me how this uh, connected to the, the next book. This book that I'm writing now or? That the book that we are, we are talking about this. Oh, Mumi, you mean. No, Mumi and, uh, Mumi oh, and the, ah, I the, see. The, the recent book that uh -huh. is just out, came out in the January, Meishis uit the Dorp, is the girls from the village. Um, most of the literature that has to do with uh, post-colonial uh, time and with colonial times are set in, in The Hague. The Hague is seen as the widow of uh, Indonesia because the people went there up and back, back and forth. Uh, but actually that is the white part. That's the part of the people with money and who were working at the at the what is plantations, uh, plantation or the owners or the, or you know had this uh, the, the uh, who had the high jobs the high collar jobs, but the color people with 
who are mixed, where I am from, the social, that there's an other social group, that were the children of the, actually, they were children of slaves. If you are really looking at history, my grandmother had a mother who was at the age of 11, taken from a, a Probolingo, a small kampung near Probolingo, at the age of 11, that they were telling her parents who didn't, couldn't pay the debt for the debt, if you are, uh, you will get, she will get a nice job, you know, nearby. But she was put on a boat and brought to Sumatra to work in Arche in a military camp. There she was thrown, as with many other girls, in the kitchen to do anything for the soldiers, what they needed, anything. And they had no own rights or wish, desire or whatever. No, they were just so they there to, for their pleasure. Slave, yeah. And uh, so, yeah. And even my grandmother growing up, being like six years old, she realized she didn't know the word yet because slavery was officially, did not exist anymore. But in fact, Holland had found new words to still use slavery for their means. And uh, so my grand mother's, grandmother's mother had my grandmother at the age of 12 in a military camp. And my grandmother remembers how her father from Germany, who was, uh, I don't know the word in English for that, Ronselen, and who was uh, taken drunk from Germany and also put on a, he had sign to sign, so he got money to drink more and was put like many more men on the boat to be in Sumatra, not knowing they had to fight there. And so they were connected there and getting children and they are one of many. It happened to many girls and it happened to many men who didn't even know they were fighting a very, very heavy war. And this is part of history that the Dutch never spoke about. You couldn't find it in the books. And I think it's time to tell the stories. Where did you get all this narration? I mean, um, did your family keep some stories? Or how did you get this I first, when I was young, I, we all, I used to ask a lot. Maybe mm, that's not, maybe that's not normal. I love the stories of the older people because they, maybe that's the writer in me because it made, it created image, my, it helped and it um, inspired my imagination. But in the beginning when I was young, I had my own pictures and with, with their stories. And then when you get older, you know how to ask more. And then you realize the pictures don't fit with the real, true stories. So you have to adapt it. So it was a very, strong learning process in my youth to listen to the stories of my grandparents, my uncles, my uh, aunties. So for example, an uncle said, yeah, when my father died, and his father was also German, also military man, they, I was put in an orphanage and my mother was not allowed to take care of me anymore. And her mother was, his mother was Javanese. And he said that my mother came with my favorite uh, dish to the gate, but they didn't allow her in because she was only allowed once a month to visit me for half an hour. Imagine, the kid is looking from the window outside, sees his mother, mother is sent away with his favorite dish. I mean, what does it to a child? What does it to a child in an orphanage to hear? You are lucky that you're here in this orphanage because you're baptized. And all the other kids of your color, they, they don't go to heaven when they die they go to hell. I mean, what does it with you? How will you look at the world and how will you look at the other kids who go to hell? And I think that's important to know. This part of history, these, all these small details in history are important to understand because it creates a kind of people. Mm -hmm. a rule and reign is the way in, colon uh, sorry, in colonial time to, to, is a way of, it's a normal way of, of uh, what is it? To treat people, you know, it is institutionalized racism that creates a certain kind of people. We have to look at it, and we have to realize what 
is left over from that period in me. How do I look at people? And I call it uh, their uh, trapjes denken. Look at this these chairs with the with the stairs on the stairs levels. Um, I think you have if you want to be a writer, if you want to be sincere in life, you have to dare put yourself somewhere there and see how you look at other people. Where do you put them? On, on which chair? How do you think you relate to them? Because then you will understand how you were made, how you look at other people. For me, it's an important thing. I'm a psychologist and probably it comes from somewhere. But in that way, I can also um, identify with many kind of people that I usually wouldn't like to identify myself with. But then I force myself, you know, I force myself also to be a military man in a camp who, or in a pupu town to be a soldier who cuts off the fingers of a Balinese woman to get the ring, you know, quickly to go up. I have to do that because otherwise I can't write a good book. You have to do it in mind. I have to do it in mind. <laughs> yes, in mind. But back to the book. Yeah? Back to the book. So this this is the background of the book, and the girls from the village is, is who's the, the yeah. The that, main these are girls. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Who did you bring me back to the subject? Oh, I yeah, really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> the girls in the from the village, uh, they are all the children of this military man that worked in the colonial army, the, the main characters. But sometimes the father is white, sometimes the father is mixed, sometimes the father is Indonesian. But all of them were, were in the same army. But the education is not the same. Also, the way of looking at other people is not the same. And even the way they look at their own wives is not the same. And uh, by telling a story, in an environment like that, where you think, where the, uh, the Dutch, the white people think oh, they're all the same, they're all brown somehow, and uh, they're all from this colonial type. Treat them the same way, but the, the girls themselves notice that their parents do not treat all of those people that, they, that the outside world thinks they're all alike the same way. And that creates a very strange feeling inside of the girls that you can not uh, be friends with them and you can be friends with them and not with them. Why? Mm -hmm. And if you do the research, you find out that it has to do with this colonial times, not with the present. So this, there is a kind of social classes inside the uh, Indo community. As a result yeah, of the absolutely. colonial times, yeah. Yeah. Because it's like an in institutional racism yes, exactly. and internalized racism. Internalized, that's of course the most important thing. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, I want to uh, go, uh, I want to give the, the time to the audience to ask questions. So uh, basically, uh, I'm focusing on three books, uh, which is all about the, uh, the experience of uh, these uh, girls, the Indo girls growing up with the burden of the colonial time uh, with these three books. Um, but I want to give um, the audience um, the time to ask questions. So uh, please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. One. OK, we start with one. Please introduce yourself shortly you, you and ask. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. The, uh, I think the. Hello, I I'm Isna Marifa. Um, I thank you for for your very interesting um, expression of your inspirations and um, uh, backgrounds of your stories. But I want to quote now um, a message that my cousin forwarded from a friend of hers who is a Dutch Indo. Um, when she knew that I was coming to see this um, event. And she said, she is a source of inspiration and activism of my generation. This is you, yeah. Being the first to write a novel about being Indonesian Dutch, making us visible. So I think you have done a great service to the Indo-Dutch um, community. 
but um, I think my question now is actually on how you've been received um, outside of the Dutch Indo community, of the mainstream um, Dutch community, possibly the the uh, those who are not mixed racially, uh, have have they questioned um, some of the things you have? Um, explored in in the stories what you've um, expressed in terms of the difficulties of um, identity and knowing histories and trauma from past generations Thanks. when I wrote a book um, the most because it was it was it's not so easy to write a book and a story with a storyline and all that but to write a book about such a difficult subject and to make it understandable for the people who are outsiders of the theme, you need to create a way to tell it. And when I could only write that novel when I knew the solution. And my solution was um, absolutely oh, sorry, inspired by a, 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 a Swiss writer, um, Max Frisch. He, he had written an uh, experimental book, Kantenbaum. Kantenbein, and in the, where he was dividing himself into two characters, and that was very just it, it stayed experimental. I, I really like the the author for all these books, but this book was not more than an ex experiment. But it was like a present to me because I knew if I want to explain what it is like for someone who is only living in a dominant, he's only part of the dominant culture, this is the way to explain what happens when you live between two cultures. Because uh, I decided to split up the person, so the writer, and she is experimenting with what if what if in my youth I had been Sonia or when I had been Zon, two characters? They could have been sisters, they could have been twins, doesn't matter, in the same house. But they made different choices. And the choices are not the big choices. The choices in life are actually rather small that you make. Very, very small choices. But it has a consequence. Every small choice has a consequence. You, that's how you create friends. That's how you betray friends. That's how you stand behind and, and 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 support friends and making friends means also is a development in which you also make new choices so you can go further and further away from your the roots and and be disloyal to part of you and we by using these two characters i could ch show it it's not easy to read in the beginning later on you can just consume it but in the beginning, I, will, I, will, I did really demand something from the reader. That is less difficult for the people who are living between cultures. It's a lot easier because they totally understand that you have to make choices all the time, that you do make choices. And sometimes choices against your true wish. And it feels like betrayal sometimes. And uh, children don't even have the opportunity to rationalize but at a certain age you start to realize and so I could only write it from this realization from having uh, having done the study of psychology clinical psychology I used all that I used literature from uh, the Swiss writer and that's all together that's how I wrote it and why I wrote it still there would be people who think oh it's too difficult and put it aside but the challenge in my work, because I took a lot of effort in the, that it had to be like high literature. So I would make the intellectual people continue, go on, even though it's not their business, in fact. And for the Indonesian Dutch people, the mixers, I knew and they read it. They feel so good about the moments that I describe the youth and the colorful things and the way the music, the food, etc. They will continue reading. They will because they are so happy to finally be in this atmosphere and to re re uh, remember the 50s in which you know with the 
sometimes evil uh, parents, you know, beat the hell out of them. Or, but they will also feel all this softness, this, this, yeah, they will be homesick, nostalgic for the youth, and that will make them open up to understand the process. So that was the deal. Interesting enough, the the Indo people would uh, who really were ha so happy because I got like I think between ten and twenty uh, letters a day to thank me for the book, which is impressive. I could at the same time could continue reading it. It was too much. Sometimes people would write me like a whole book, you know, like <laughs> thirty pages of their lives because they wanted to share it with me. And um, but they always said. I don't understand how the Dutch can like it, but the Dutch did like it. It was a big success, not only for, for the mix. Uh, I, I had to give lectures, readings, and um, the Dutch in those were not used to go to readings. I mean, there would be one or two, but all the rest was white. So when I told this, I said, how is it possible? How can they like, how, how can they understand? They don't, they miss everything and all the words you're using, all the, all the, I, I used uh, Bahasa Malayu, uh, the, the trade uh, language, because we, we grew up with that language. And they said, how do they understand? I said, I don't give a shit. They've been colonizing uh, in for so long, they should at least know these words. You know? So I was also very, uh, come on. And uh, so they were like, how is it possible? But the thing was, they were so eager to understand that they would look in the dictionary. They would find that. Or, and also, I wrote it in a way that, uh, that you would understand from the context if it was important or not that I used the word that they actually didn't understand. They would understand it because of the context. And the book is still read by, by non in the Dutch in those as well as you know also by the third or fourth generation even now even though they don't know those words anymore they know probably Tidur and uh, yeah and Makan and then it stops. What about Guling? Guling? Yeah. Oh they might know <laughs> <laughs> or, or Babi Pangang. <laughs> Babi Pangang yeah God Hado 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 that would be that would be Hado Hado <laughs> Uh, if you look at the, um, if you browse the um, Dutch Indies writers, you will find Marion's names in the list from uh, Multatuli, um, Louis Couperus, Marie Dermoud, uh, and then you will have Marion Bloom. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you, I mean... I never Google uh, myself. <laughs> but, yeah, I... Um, you didn't. You didn't think of being part of this canon. Yeah? No, that was never the. I mean, I. That was never the aim or the goal or so. The goal was to write a book that I wanted to read when I was fifteen, sixteen. That was my only goal. And uh, when I had my list of literature, I had so many because I read. I loved reading. But then the last book on the list of my literature list for the uh, high school was my own title. It wasn't even this this one that we're talking about. It was an other book, Fathers van Betekenis, in Dutch. It would be Meaningful Fathers. I intended to write that book. It's I did write it. I didn't write it exactly like I planned at the time because it appeared to be necessary to write so many instead of that one book. But um, I wrote it because when I read the Max Havel lab, I moved to some people might have read it here because it's about uh, or at least Saija and Adinda. But uh, <laughs> but uh, this book with uh, the Pak van Schalman, the, the, there was a back that uh, with the contents and that uh, this uh, Drogstoppel that founded this guy and uh, uh, published it. My, when I read it, I thought the book was just great. It was such a great idea to describe the situation in this way. So I was very impressed. But I thought, why didn't he write anything about the Indo people, the mixed ones? Because they did exist. There were even more than than the white white uh, uh, Dutch in the in the colonial time. I thought he was also an Indo. No, I don't think. No, don't think. If you if you think so, just prove it to me. Okay, I can use it, but I don't think so. No. And but anyway, it is his um, 
in his book that was lacking us. So I decided, I w and I thought this Drogstoppel, who is the character who, who printed it, um, is uh, threw it out because he said, this is not interesting. <laughs> and then I will write that part that he threw out. So that was the plan. And so, and I, and I called it Meaningful Fathers. That book, Meaningful Fathers, I could only write in 1987, 86 I wrote it, after having done a lot of research as well in Indonesia as in uh, Australia, in the United States of America, uh, in Canada, because I uh, learned, I had interviewed a lot of people already in Holland, first generation, second generation, uh, first generation mostly. But uh, in um, to write a book, I wanted to most of all talk with men who uh, did not like to stay in Holland and why. And that was interesting. Indeed, indeed, they were more conscious of the reasons why they did not like to live in the, in the, Netherlands. In the Netherlands. And I learned a lot from that. Though the men who stayed, they were more, I'm not, I don't want to be impolite, but they were more like sheep. They would go for the uh, security, uh, for the social, this security. social security. And the ones who went away, because they were, they were always kind of angry about the situation, they didn't mind to clean. They had to clean houses, which was something they looked down upon, because that was, you know, you would never do. That was work for the lowest, lowest. Now, in the stage or wherever they came in Australia, they had to sweep the floor. And it's better for them than Of being. course, it's better for your character, because you grow. Yes, you grow. You have to start there. I started sweeping. I mean, you know, uh, earning my money with cleaning the houses. Houses. I'm very, very proud that I did. <laughs> that, I don't think people here believe that, but you have to. But it's true. <laughs> but it's true. But Ivan told me, stop with that because the time that you are doing that, you could write and you earn money with the publications. So stop. If you want to write, write all the time and earn your money with the publication. And don't stop cleaning the houses of other people. They should clean it themselves. <laughs> we had to say it many times before I stopped. So, Marion, I, I interviewed a, a, a writer, a French writer, but from Asian background. And she, she exactly said the same, uh, same thing uh, with what you said, that she wanted to write something that she didn't find it in the French <laughs> literature. Um, my question is, uh, first, she, she's Asian. I have mm -hmm. two questions. The first question is, um, is there, in, in France, you have a francophone, a, a French literature, uh, and it's only for the white French. Yeah. What about in Holland? This is my, that's my first question. But the second question is that, um, uh, Indo is now being more minority. Uh, in Holland, because more migrants coming from Africa, mm -hmm. from the other place. And so, uh, like in France, uh, the Asian um, migrants or Asian French or French with Asian background is considered like a model mi migrants. They are, uh, they are docile. They yeah, are, yeah. yeah. So they the same question yeah. to you. So yeah. two questions. Um, um, there's so much to say. After your uh, what you said, so I have to choose carefully what what is the most important for for this moment. It's difficult because there's a lot going on in my mind. Um, of course, the Dutch who Indo Dutch who came here, they didn't consider them as migrants at all. They were thinking they went back to their their country because colonial times means that they thought they were better than the local, the original um, citizens, right? They looked, actually, the col colony made them look down because it was the Hayagi. That is another mentality. I'm not saying everybody did that, look down, but so in general. They don't have the migrant mentality. It's, it, they don't have the migrant complexity, yeah? No, but... They were also seen by the Dutch as good examples for how people can integrate and 
behave and being obedient, hard workers, all that. Yes, definitely. Most of them. But the second generation was much more revolting compared to the Asian in France or the Asians in, in the United States of America. I learned so much from reading, for example, actually I was, nobody did, there was no translation, so, but in French it was more difficult, but I tried. I started to read more the English uh, my, my, migrants, especially the women, because the women always first anyway. The, the female um, second generation um, uh, migrant writers in the States taught me a lot, even though I was already publishing, but taught me a lot about the difference of Asian, being totally Asian and have an Asian education or being a consequence of colonial times. Because you have, as you use the right word, you have inter in internalized the racism and you have first to get rid of that. And so that means you have to look at it. Yeah, so. Um, Did I uh, reply to both of your questions? Huh? Um, not really. No. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> more or less, or not more at all. Or less, but I, but I, again, if if uh, from the audience want to raise a question, because oh, okay, yeah, we have uh, somebody from that. Thank you. Hello, Ibu Marion. Uh, my name is Bini. I am uh, Tante Maria's uh, niece. Hi. Hi, Bini. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So my aunt's also uh, Indonesian Dutch. No, she's become the Dutch citizen, right? But she's Totok, Indonesian Totok. Totok she's a yeah. Buginous Indonesian. Yeah, right. So in your book, uh, do you only... Uh, discuss about the intergenerational trauma of Indonesian Dutch, or is there any specifically about the uh, social, no, cultural construct of uh, specific ethnicity? Like, because the the thing of um, cultural construction of Buginis is also very challenging for Tata Maria so, as well. Yeah. yeah. Because she's become a big boogeyness in the Netherlands, but she's also torn yeah. between two cultures. Absolutely, like she yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the thing is with uh, being as like with the Moluccans, it's actually about the same story. Even though the boogeyness were not like uh, the Moluccans were not so politically aware, yeah. they were more victims of the situation, and they but they were put in the same camps. The camps were divided on being Muslim or up or uh, Christian. Okay. So they were together with um, Moluccan people. And most of the people in the in Netherlands, also the people who should know, I mean, because of their their uh, profession, don't know about this part of the of colonial history. Yeah. It's a, I, all the time I'm saying, telling, um, I know she won't, will never do it, my neighbor. This is the, n the niece, niece of my of neighbor, my, my friend, actually, yeah. my very close friend. And, but I don't know her for so long now. If I had known her for long, I would have already helped her write up her book. But uh, I told her husband many times that he should write her history because it's very, very interesting. And nobody did that yet. Yeah. And I think I, I have still have so many subjects to do because the way they used in the in the colonial time, they used the Moluccan people to fight. Right? There was also people from Manado. There were certain um, populations of the Indonesia from certain islands, they could more easily get into the army because of the depths or because of the poverty of the land or the fertility and all that. So they made use of that, the Dutch. And so the Buginese were also victims of that. But then, of course, they were betrayers to their family and to their the, the community once the 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 revolution started, or when, when uh, let's say, when Indonesia uh, said that we are independent from you, you are not anymore Dutch, uh, 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 a Dutch colony, and uh, there, this is a painful part of history. I th think a very painful part of history. So I mentioned it in uh, Mumi, 
more or less, in an other way. I mean, I'm not mentioning because it's not it's a novel, right? But you can feel sense that this is also happening. I, I do have space for that. But to really write a book about it, I think somebody from the community should do that. Mm. Um, and that's why I'm telling them all the time, you know, write this book. And um, in the latest book that meshes out the daughter, the girls from the village, yeah. there is a person. I don't explain in the story that it is Buginese or whatever, but it, it, it has, the family has an Indonesian name. Okay. So they are also seen in another way by the ones who have a European name. Yeah. So I show that that it does exist and it is something I would like to continue with if I didn't have so many other things to write about too. So I really hope someone will do it because it will, even in the history books written now, it's hardly mentioned at all. Actually, it's not mentioned yet, even in the better books yeah. that are written in the past 10 years. There are many books written now, but it is, it is, um, percent well percent three in percentage it is very small you know uh, oh. this amount of of, uh, of people but it is a painful story yeah. Be and she had to she fled actually she fled from home to become Dutch but you'll never be Dutch yeah and they, they never also uh, cannot be Indonesian as well. When no, they come no. home, they, they, they got labeled or stereotyped as uh, some outsiders. Yeah. Like you're the Dutch, but they are actually the descendant of Indonesia. Yeah. But yeah, they torn between two cultures, as you said it. Definitely, yes. yeah, even more of in another sense, yeah. And uh, uh, I think the, 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 for example, if she would go back that wouldn't be a problem. They would embrace her, you know, the family. But the fear to go back because how they fled. Yeah. So the fear is still, it's also internalized. Yes. yes. Thank you, Ibu. Back to this. Um, because colonial it, the Dutch colonization to Indonesia has um, has passed. Yeah. Uh, my question is whether the Indo community is still there as a category, and how uh, how how the Dutch see the other uh, groups in terms of its literature. I mean. Do you uh, w were you considered as there is a special uh, uh, literature for Indo literature, and then probably these days you also see the uh, migrant literature and how integrate all this um, literature within the Dutch whole Dutch literature. Yeah. I could uh, I could talk I will talk about it a little bit, but I think it should never be the concern of the writer, you know, to to do that. This is up to the literature. The people who study literature, I should be busy writing and not care about whatever they think of my writings because then I cannot write anywhere. There will always be some. The price is actually not good. So I I, I, I kept forgetting about the price in the beginning, but everybody started congratulating me. So And I know it's an important price and should help me getting my work uh, translated abroad. Okay, that's good. A good thing, very good thing. But as a writer, I should never ever have those kind of compliments or, or bad critics. I should write from here and keep on writing like this and ignore the fact that it will be evaluated or, or categorized one day by someone or by more people. I actually don't want to like, don't want to hear it. And um, also try to avoid reading it. But if we talk about it, my, the Indo community, which I cannot avoid either, uh, there is still not one community that has never been because the col colony came, post-colonial, the colony came with the Indo and Dutch to Holland. And actually in the first 
let's say 30 years, it was still there. Mm -hmm. And I hoped that my, with my book, and I published it at the age of, age of 30, and I, in the same year, I uh, had my film about my background, about my roots also um, in the cinema. Both were very, very um, successful. And then you think, oh, and, and the papers would write, oh, it's an eye opener. Her book is an eye opener. The movie is an eye opener. But in fact, the IO eyes need to be opened like every two years again. <laughs> So we cannot never stop, you know, making waking each other up and listen, don't forget, especially the ones who are not having any profit from this development, which is the majority. And so finally, finally, something is moving. There will be more his, true historical books. There is not so much... Um, hidden anymore, there's less coming out of the archives. But a good example of that is still not the way it should be, is this fact. My, I told you before about my grand, the mother of my grandmother, 11 years old and 12 years old when my, my grandmother was born. It was a lot of research for my book, Indo. Indo is a, is a non-fiction book, it's, it's the truth in my, from, of my personal history and my life. Um, to f get this information, I had to go into the archives. Also, the hidden archives. The archives were not allowed to open up, but I always had people who helped me with that. And two years ago, I think, one and a half year ago, it was opened, and one can just get it on the internet, find all these facts on the internet. So you think, wow, this is progress? No, because when it was still in the archives, because they didn't have a ballpoint yet, right? Everything was with a pencil, which you can also re uh, erase. erase. And it was also light because of the time. Now, somebody, I don't know who did that. Maybe it's like uh, after 65, there was no, not, uh, Chinese letters were not allowed on the magazines anymore. So there were some military men who had, were with a black stiff and, um, taking out all the Chinese letters in the magazines before they could go to the bookshops. Maybe some people there, I don't know, uh, some uh, random people had a task, or maybe it was um, one person who had to do it, and he thought, I don't believe this. But the, the dates, the years of the grandmother being born, uh, sorry, the, that she was born, the, the mother of my grandmother, it was changed with 10 years. So she was all of a sudden born 10 years earlier because I couldn't believe that a girl 12 years old would, uh, gave birth, uh, uh, would give birth to... So there is an editing, ed edition, uh, edited. Yeah, maybe it's one person who does that or it is uh, uh, from above. Oh, you better change that because that's not good for our... Uh, yeah, for the Dutch uh, <laughs> history to, to make that... Uh, oh, to open up the, those facts. I don't know what the reason is, but it's a, a remarkable. It's remarkable. I heard it from more people that they changed it with ballpoint. Oh. But maybe it's, it's just one something person. something to note. Who, huh? Yeah, it's something to take note. Yes. If this happens a lot, then that probably there is a, a systematic <laughs> <laughs> for Indonesian, the, the word systematic is in. It's important now, especially uh, uh, closing to uh, the yes, election. I totally understand. <laughs> yes, and I think maybe Massive, systematic. Yeah. the Indonesian might have learned this from the Dutch, right? Because <laughs> the whole bureaucratic uh, system can come from uh, is coming from the Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Systematic, the <laughs> structure, systematic, and massive. <laughs> so I want to ask you if uh, from the audience uh, does not still doesn't have any other question, I want to ask you a simple thing. Okay, Simple is fine. Yeah. yeah. How do you realize that um, the Indo community is different from the the other... Uh, migrant groups? No, not the migrants. Uh, Forget about the migrants. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, white, uh, the white Dutch. How do you realize it in the beginning? You, you live in a kind of... Camp is, is no, no, camp? no, I never lived in a camp. No, no, but your, no. your, your, 
your parents? No, no, the, my parents never lived in the camp. In it's a, pension, a complex. In the beginning, the first years, they were put in some kind of cheap hotels, mm -hmm. very cheap hotels. And they were never allowed to eat what they wanted or so, you know, because yeah, there were those. And the, the money was taken from the salary. So they could not decide what to eat themselves because the food was on the table. And then the money was taken from the, before they got the money, the money, the money for the hotel was taken away. So they had like, uh, in the beginning, 70% uh, was taken because they, also they could not decide what clothes. That was the, the clothes that other people didn't want to buy that they went, they, they went to. So they didn't have anything to say about their own lives mm -hmm. and they were longing to live their own lives. So once they were on their own and they finally had a, 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 a house to live in, they did anything to get to create their own food, but still you could not find the ingredients, the the spicy spices, and also the yeah, mostly the, also the kind of what they were used to. Even the rice flour, they would never be able to. I, I remember my 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 parents would not kill someone, but <laughs> they would really die to get uh, tapioca, for example. Ah, yeah, tapioca. And so the what you can see is that food. And nostal nostalgia, so rindu, is connected. Right? Um, so the way most of the people lived was, some would say, oh, once a week, my the man in the house, they, he wants uh, rice. And for the rest, they would adapt. But there were also, like in my house, no, my father wanted the rice every day. Then I had an uncle who wanted, like in Indonesia, twice uh, right, twice time, uh, twice a day wanted rice, which was absolutely ridiculous for the Dutch, because you eat bread and, and or porridge, but you don't eat twice a, a warm meal just once. So he would be even stronger. And no, I want to do it the Indonesian way. I mean Indonesian. And uh, so uh, depends on the social um, background. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the Hague. Yeah, that would be normal to eat six times a week the potatoes to show. Yeah, we know how to be be, be like the Dutch, mm -hmm. and they would the try high to. Color, the white color. The yes, high color. more not, uh, than the ones who wanted to be so much. We're not white, but wanted to be so much like the white people. They would act more like that because the white could afford to eat rice daily because they were white. But not to be white, but to want to show you belong to them. That's a tough, a tough uh, part in this whole hierarchy, you know, a of uh, hierarchy of a social uh, hierarchy. Yes, that they uh, the kids had the most problems because when they were had a dark color like me, they tried to behave in school like the white because that was what the parents already taught them. But in school they would be the blacks, so that is gives a lot of, uh, yeah, inconvenience. So when I was, uh, for example, um, interviewing them, that I was interesting for me to interview them because they had already this, this, this conflict that I wrote about in my first novel, but they weren't aware of it. But again, within your experience, when was I would always yeah, feel I, you've opened. You, your eyes is open that, oh, this is, I'm different. I'm no, no, no. I'm treated different. Di the dif feeling different is mm -hmm. something comes back later. In the beginning, the, the social group I belonged to, we only saw each other. We were with each other. If it was a family, it was big, and they would stay with the family. So you you are with, with, with uh, in those group, all yeah. the time. Once you go, so that's normal. You don't even know there are other people. Then once you go to the, the school, you will see how they treat you different. And my, first, this is a good example. It's a silly example, but it works. We were taught that you have to clean yourself in the Kamamandi with water. It's very important. <laughs> you use paper first, okay. But you, the water, you cannot do without the water. Chabok is very important. If you don't chabok, you are, you know, you are like... So you have bottle chabok, yeah? Yes, always. <laughs> and the... My mother didn't teach me. She let my grandmother teach me before going to school. Before four years old, I had to be able to do it myself. 
Otherwise, but you, but you already have this, uh, not the Jungkook toilet. No, yet. no, we didn't have that. So <laughs> it is very difficult for a four years old to use a bottle, heavy bottle with water made of glass and to wash yourself, you know, and then without spoiling the water in the hole, because it's not like the uh, like old Kama Mandi. And uh, so you, they teach you that and they say, hey, you do uh, the chabok. If not, if you cannot do that, don't go to the uh, Kamakachil, yeah? You can only go to the Kamakachil, then you keep it for da at home. <laughs> how, as a four-year-old, how you can keep it because you don't know. There is no bottle with water. There's only some water you have to run, and you cannot run with the pants down to the, the water. So, yeah, you are in trouble. You say, how can I solve this problem? And you have the feeling that if you don't obey your mother, because that was the worst. You will not become like the Dutch, eh? those dirty people. Kotor, yeah? Kotor. You don't become Kotor like them, okay? That's how they talk to you. So you don't want to be Kotor. So, but the first time I did that, you know, I thought I wait until all the kids are back in the. That's already wrong. So I see in the school, you know, yeah. Yeah, so four years old. <laughs> I go, you know, nobody, no kids anymore left. They are in the, in the classroom. So I go quickly, I took the toilet paper make it wet, you know, <laughs> run back and think, okay, nobody's uh, has seen me, but of course there will always be a nun. Hey, what are you doing? Watch! <laughs> she let, put, so you're playing with water? No, 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 not playing. What are you doing? What are you doing with the water? So it's like I'm playing with, so they put, she put me in the corner. I'm not allowed to go back in the classroom, but I have to, in the corridor, I have to f face the wall and stand like that. It's Yes, <laughs> yes, punishment, because I want to do, follow the rules of my mother. That is just a crazy example, but so there are many rules you cannot follow anymore. Because, for example, I don't know if it's uh, still here like that in Indonesia, in Java, but my mother taught me when I was young, that was normal. When they offer you something, well, now I'm very kasar, I'm not halus anymore, but we were taught to be halus, okay? Whatever they offer you, even if you're really hungry, you say, no, thank you, no, thank you. Huh? The way you say it, very nice, no, thank you. They will give you any way, so you don't worry if you're hungry. You just keep saying, no, no, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> so, it's true, because the first years, you live with people like you, so always when you keep saying, no, thank you, you want a cookie, but, no, thank you. You get it anyway, because before you're out of the door, they put it in your pockets or, you know, and they put it in your hands. So, yeah, I have the cookies and, and the cakes anyway, the quick. Now, you are the first that I was already eight years old. I was, for the very first time, invited to the Dutch family. It was a birthday. I also, they also taught me something else, the family, because it was my first time in a Dutch family. Very first time. But I had been in parties with my own people, okay? Then you don't know all the people, but you go and you have to kiss, you know? Go, kiss. Three times. Uh, not at that time, unfortunately not, but yeah, you kiss. Sometimes they hug you and okay, you have to, you have to do it, it's poli being polite. All these strangers, old people, young people, yeah? Not your own age, only the, the, the adults. You don't know even that you do it, it's normal. Now, I come to this very first time in a Dutch family. I'm late because I could not decide what, what uh, present I would buy. And I enter and they say, oh, you're late. <laughs> they ran away, I'm all alone, I don't know where to go. They just, oh, you're late, and they, they ran away. So I'm in that house, never been there. And I see all kids there, and there's another room closed with a lot of smoke, everybody's smoking. And there are the adults. And I was taught, you never, ever go play with the kids if you have not say hello, said hello to the adults. <laughs> so there I go. They had never, ever seen a, a kid go in. But first of all, they had never seen a brown kid get in, in <laughs> into the room. So I go there and I start with... The very old lady, the first, because you first have to say hello to the oldest. That's also what I was taught. It's not Dutch, you know? So you see, who's the oldest? They all look old. Okay, finally, you find one and shake the hands and say, okay, 
congratulations, and you kiss. <laughs> Do a, oh. <laughs> and then you start kissing everybody like crazy. <laughs> Shake hands and kiss. And you already start feeling a little bit uncomfortable that you do something that they that they're not you know you feel it but you don't know what and then they were so excited to have this crazy kid who's kissing everybody so one man picks me up from the floor throws me in, in <laughs> and that makes a lot of ah, well. so at the other side where the kids are they have these uh, glass doors they were closed the kids said what is that noise they see me going into the air. So they open it. What are you doing there? They're screaming. And I feel, oh, I am ridiculous. And I don't know why. I don't know why I'm ridiculous. Still, the horror is not over. <laughs> they, OK, they let me go to the kids. Then the, the mother of the kids, these the coming with the birthday cake. You will be singing. OK, that I understand. It was cut. And she probably feels sorry for me. So I'm the very first person where she goes with the birthday cake to get the piece. And I say, like, I was thought, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Next moment, I see all the kids eating a birthday cake. And <laughs> but I had no clue that I told no thank you because I just did what, they, what I, yeah. I, I was taught. And I didn't feel like refusing. I just felt like being polite. And I thought, they don't like me. First of all, they throw me in the air. <laughs> They're screaming, making me making fun of me. And then I don't get a birthday cake. <laughs> and you don't dare to ask the, for the birthday cake? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is even oh, worse. Oh. Finally, this woman thinks she might have read my, you know, <laughs> the puff of response, you know, the water coming out. So she sees me and she goes over. Do you still want, don't want to? You want, want it anyway? And I go, I'm so shocked that she can read my mind. So, no, 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 no thank you. Because I don't want to be a raccoon. <laughs> and then I realized this was my last chance. I'm not going to get it. So I pretended having a headache. <laughs> you know what happened? They didn't let me go home with my headache. No, I had to go to the bathroom. And they gave me this horrible... <laughs> <laughs> Medication. medication. I had to drink this stuff. <laughs> so instead of a cake, you get medication. Yes. Oh. Very bitter. <laughs> so a bitter pill, that's a Dutch expression. I learned from that. I still, even though I learned, but I did not dare should, to say yes. They should give you food because the medication have to go Yeah, they didn't. Wow. They didn't offer me a birthday cake again uh, because I would have said yes for sure. But to uh, be honest, it took me a very long time before I was able to say, oh, yes, uh, please. In Dutch, it would be, ja, graag. It's, oh, yes, yes, I would love to. That I could not say even when I was already with my husband. We weren't mar married yet, but I was there. And I, I, I pretended because I was so embarrassed that I couldn't say, oh, oh yes, please. And I knew I should. I uh, pretended to like bread without butter, without cheese, just the plain bread, <laughs> because I didn't want to feel ridiculous <laughs> about my refusal all the time. <laughs> it took me so long, even that even Ivan, my husband, started to believe that I preferred dry bread for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> that is, and he was surprised to find me eat, you know, a lot on the bread at home, at my parents' house. Anyway. You have to learn, even though you know here rationally, your emotions also have to accept the new rules. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Marion. It's a, such a beautiful story <laughs> of your um, childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and we understand that this big understanding started with this small experience in the toilet and in, <laughs> and in food. <laughs> Well, we actually only have five minutes left. Be short, uh, please be, sh be very short. Because Marion, you are the enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, although this room is quite cold, but your story, your childhood, sto your childhood story is make my heart feel warm <laughs> anyway. Uh, my question is, will be uh, the first one. 
why do you choose um, novel or uh, fiction or uh, book, especially uh, as a medium to share your story about identity uh, and your roots? Uh, and the second one, maybe uh, I curious to ask you about how do you make your perspective more sharp to uh, to share your voiceless uh, from the uh, sorry, the voice from voiceless uh, in every your uh, works. Thank you. The last question is a bit difficult for me to understand, but I'll, I'll quickly uh, give answer a reply to your first question. Is um, I uh, writing was my way of surviving as a kid, and so of course the writing came first. But when I was also invited to not to write, sometimes the was impossible to write about it, but I cut images, and that's how why I started filmmaking. And uh, uh, so now I follow. Also, sometimes my life is very difficult. Like now when I lost my husband, I couldn't write and I couldn't paint, but I couldn't make films, let's say. But I could and not, could not even paint, but I could draw. Or just glow, glue. I, I just glue stuff on top of each other and would, you know. So uh, uh, the expression, the way of expression and tell stories depends on the ability I have at that very moment, and the subject as well, of course. Yeah, I think they uh, they answer the questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, not from the external point of view, from but from the very personal point of view. Uh, I would like to thank Marion very much for sharing beautiful stories, and I would uh, ask the I hope I mean uh, please the, the audience if you don't find Marion's book. Uh, Mumi Gadis Ratus Tahun here, please find it in the Gramedia. Uh, not probably not in the bookshop, but you can find it in a, a uh, online for sure. Yeah. I noticed that it is online, yeah. available online. It's for available sure. on, at least it's available online to, to buy online and get the printed book. I think it's still there, and it's a, be a beautiful book. and you can probably understand um, or see Marion's uh, strategy or uh, uh, literature strategy by reading her books. And I hope that these are the two books being will be translated into Indonesian. So we have at least the three trilogy. Yeah, I would love to have my books translated. I know there's already almost done the translation of my first novel. Ah, oh, so it's almost finished. There's someone in Holland now continuing because oh. uh, because of her. Uh, a problem with the attack, the infarct. So she could not finish it because ah. of the infarct. But now she's working together with someone uh, who is an Indonesian woman who is in 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 the ho uh, Holland and who is very eager because he likes the book a lot to translate. So there will be a follow up. Yeah. Thank you very much. We hope that we'll we'll have Marion again in the next year with the presentation of the book, and we yeah. ask the Erasmus Heinsen and uh, Dutch Embassy to yeah. again invite Marion. Can I still say that I really I find it a great pleasure to have you as my interviewer, and you're a great friend anyway, and then you're a greater, even greater interviewer or the other way. I don't know, but anyway, there was. <laughs> So if I can come next time, I really want to be sitting with you again. <laughs> it's, <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> it's a compliment. Yeah. It's a big compliment for me. But we thank the um, the um, organizer of this festival very much. Uh, I'll go uh, I'll give a uh, big applause again for Marion, and I'll give uh, the mic back.